from the world of politics. This is good news for the American people. Another strong jobs report. You know, the president, uh, since he took office, we've seen 8.3 million jobs added in the U.S. economy. To the world of business. Secretary Granholm specifically told the producers, please produce more oil, and the rest of the world is looking for it. This is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. We start this week pretty much where we left off last week, and that is concerned about inflation, as we're going to have those CPI numbers out on Wednesday. And now President Biden says he'd like to talk to us about it on Tuesday before the numbers come out. To explain all this to us, we turn now to our Washington correspondent, Joe Matthew, host of Sound On weekdays on Bloomberg Radio. So unfair question, Joe. Is it because the president thinks the numbers are going to be good and he wants credit, or do you think they're going to be bad and he wants to explain them? That is a great question, and I'm sure that they're writing speeches that might work in both scenarios uh, here, David. To your point, Wednesday is the big number, and the messaging machine here at the White House is cranking up into overtime as we get closer to that data point coming out. The president, no matter what the topic is these days, when he speaks publicly, tries to speak to it, look at it through the prism of inflation and the efforts by this administration to lower prices. He'll actually be speaking today about lowering the price of internet service, specifically for low-income Americans, something that comes from the infrastructure law, the bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed and signed last year. The Affordable Connectivity Program will make it available for people to cut their internet costs by $30 a month. It's a new partnership that the White House is announcing today with 20 companies, including AT&T and Verizon. But to your point, a national address is set for tomorrow where the president will speak again to the efforts by the administration to lower prices. And I would expect that he will again call on Congress to pass the Innovation and Competition Act, that bill that includes the Computer Chip Act and would invest billions in domestic manufacturing. This gets to the supply chain crisis. The president made this call in Ohio on Friday. Most of us agree on this. Pass the damn bill and send it to me. If we do, it's going to help bring down prices, bring home jobs, empower America's manufacturing comeback. But of course, David, passing that bill and delivering it to the president is easier said than done, as House and Senate versions need to be married into one bill that lawmakers can get their heads around. This is why it has been stalled out on Capitol Hill for the better part of a year, David. It's a really good point whether they get it done or not is a question. Also, I must say, it may be a really good idea to make more chips. I'm not sure most Americans, when they say they're concerned about inflation, are thinking about getting more chips made. I think they're worried about their gas prices. <laughs> This is very true, although a lot of the items that Americans are not able to get from washing machines uh, to dishwashers, household appliances, and David, even military hardware requires computer chips that in many cases the manufacturers cannot get. So this will get right to the conversation about household prices when the president speaks tomorrow. Okay, Joe, thank you so much for joining us today. That's Joe Matthew, our Washington correspondent, and once again, he is host of Sound On on Bloomberg Radio every day of the week at 5 p.m. And now to continue this discussion about inflation, those CP numbers, we turn to Douglas Holtz Eakin. He's president of the American Action Forum, and he's the former director of the Congressional Budget Office. So, Doug, thanks so much for being with us. What are you expecting on sure. Wednesday? Are we going to start seeing some relief from inflation? I think we have one more month of very high inflation, perhaps higher than the, than the previous in the year-over-year -year measure, but, but certainly uh, it should begin to abate uh, as we go forward. The Fed's obviously moving in the right direction. We have uh, other uh, headwinds on the global economy, notably China, that are going to pull down demand. But, uh, you know, th there's no real immediate relief, and th there really isn't anything that the White House can do that will bring immediate relief. They, they talk a lot about, for example, uh, chips. We're going we're gonna to produce chips, uh, and, and that'll bring down prices. But the first thing you have to do is build chip factories, and that adds to demand for investment goods and for construction and for things which are already stressed uh, supply chains, and that, that would increase inflation. Same is true in housing. Housing and shelter are a key part of the CPI. We'll see a, another number where shelter inflation is probably going to be five or, or north of five uh, in, on Wednesday. That, that's a third of the typical family budget. That's a, a huge part of the inflation story. It doesn't get fixed quickly. And, and everyone says, well, we just need more houses. So you don't solve an inflation problem with a residential housing boom. I, I, so. I don't see how a big construction program uh, is the answer. They they have a they are really caught, um, and and quite frankly, 
everyone is, once you let inflation get entrenched, you have nothing but bad choices. And what the Federal Reserve is engaged in is cooling the labor market, cooling the housing market, and we're going to see numbers that show that cooling, and in and of themselves, they'll be depressing, right? They're not, they're not showing the strength that they had previously, but that's the necessary path to get inflation out of the domestic economy. Doug, you said there's not much the administration can do about it, but in your long and distinguished resume there, you also, as I recall, were chief economist for the Council of Economic Advisors. If you were back in that job at the White House, what about things like taking the tariffs off, the Trump tariffs on Chinese goods? Wouldn't that get costs down right away? What if the Jones Act, suspending the Jones Act on shipping costs, aren't there some things actually within the president's power that could have a fairly immediate effect on prices? Yes, you could do those. Uh, they're largely one-time impacts, but, uh, you know, you need to be able to do whatever you can in these circumstances. That's a, a political imperative for this White House. So I don't understand their hesitancy on, on the tariffs. Uh, you know, the, the very thin national security rationale for the steel and aluminum tariffs has, has never made any sense. Car tariffs were the same way. They should all go away. Uh, the Chinese tariffs, this administration has declared that strategy a failure. Why hold on to them? Uh, get those costs out of the, the supply chain. Um, those are all things that they should do. Uh, but uh, we've seen no evidence of them moving on that front. Uh, Doug, let me turn it around just a little bit. Uh, as you sure. say, the Fed is trying to get their arms around inflation, and they're going to be tightening financial conditions. And by the way, that means higher interest rates. We were told for a long time we can borrow a lot of money as a federal government and not worry too much about it because interest rates were so low. At what point does that come back and bite us as we have to service those debt costs? Well, certainly the CBO, my, my old shop, the Congressional Budget Office, has uh, for years put out a calculation that says, what happens if you, if you raise interest rates by, say, uh, 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 10 basis points or uh, 100 basis points? Uh, what happens to our, our deficit forecast? And the answer is the, the U.S. federal budget is, is a highly levered entity, and if interest rates go up, interest costs mount quickly, a trillion dollars for every percentage point. Um, so we are in that position now. And... When those interest costs go up, they are going to crowd out other things that this uh, uh, administration would like to do with the budget because you have to pay your bills on, on the interest front. So that means it gets harder to do things like supplementals for Ukraine. It gets harder to do, th to do things like supplementals for COVID-19. Or uh, the domestic policy initiatives, such as that, that remain, get crowded out. Uh, there, are no, there are no good choices because you don't really have an option of not paying. Doug, some of us are old enough to remember the so-called bond vigilantes, right, of the 1990s. Uh, is there a number? Yes. I mean, because let's be honest, even if we're talking about 3 percent interest rates, historically, that's quite low. Is there a number you get to and those bond vigilantes come back again? We haven't seen them in a long time. Uh, I've been waiting for this, but we have certainly not seen this uh, for, for 20 years. And uh, it, it will be the case that as financial conditions tighten, uh, people are going to start seeing competition for financial resources again. The U.S. government has had a huge appetite for those resources, and the bond vigilantes were there to say, no, you need to, to back off, or the private sector can't finance its investment plans, it can't finance its hiring plans, its training plans. Uh, it would be a good thing to see the, re the uh, reemergence of those bond vigilantes because we are actually undercutting our capacity for future growth with all the borrowing that we're doing at the moment. Doug, you mentioned that as interest rates go up, at some point it really affects the administration's ability to get things done that they want to get done and fund yeah. the programs. Are we to that point yet? Because we have Congress right now with a very full agenda in front of it, including aid to Ukraine, including more uh, help for COVID. There's a long list of things there. Is it affecting Congress already or is it more in the future? I think it's more in the future. Uh, the, the Congress has uh, other obstacles right now, largely political, a lot of it having to do with the midterms looming in November. Uh, we haven't seen uh, a robust conversation on either side of the aisle about uh, the deficit and debt and, and how they're making mistakes. It's beginning to emerge, and, and I think it'll be uh, a real force past the midterms and, and going into 2024. One last one here, Doug. We hear from some people part of the solution to the current problem of the mismatch of supply and demand, which is driving inflation, is to increase supply. Is there anything Congress and the administration can do in the medium term to increase supply enough to alleviate some of the in inflationary pr pressures? They certainly can do some things. And, for example, the, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that was, was passed and signed into law by the president is one of those things. It, it that devotes about $500 billion to new hard infrastructure over the next 10 years. It, it ramps up slowly so you don't get uh, a big upfront spending boom, which would cause more inflation. That's a good thing. But it also comes online slowly. So you get that, 
that relief from the, su the supply pressures, um, you know, five, six, seven years from now. Th that's a sensible strategy. It's just not dramatic relief in the near term. It's hard to get dramatic relief because to get more supply, you typically have to build it. And our problem now is too much demand. And if you try to build a lot of supply, you make that problem worse. Okay, it's always so good to have you with us. Thank you. That's Douglas Holtz Eakin of the American Action Forum. Coming up, we take a look at the war in Ukraine with retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We want to keep you up to date with news from all around the world. For that, we turn to Mark Crumpton here with the first word. David, thank you. Ukraine is rejecting Russian President Vladimir Putin's attempt to justify his invasion as an effort to defend the homeland and compare it to World War II. In a speech marking the 77th anniversary of the defeat of Nazi Germany, President Putin said the Russian military is defending, quote, what our fathers, grandfathers, and great-grandfathers fought for, end quote. A top Ukrainian advisor said on Twitter, quote, the Russian military is dying, not defending their country, but trying to occupy another, end quote. U.S. sanctions are targeting Russia's military-industrial complex and causing the Russian economy to contract. Deputy U.S. Treasury Secretary Wally Adiemo spoke to Bloomberg Television today. The reality is the one you think about what Russia is doing in Ukraine, it is a key contributor to some of the price increases that we're seeing both in energy and in food. Today, Russian ships are blocking the ability of food to get out of Ukraine. Because of Russia's actions, you've seen energy prices rise because of the, the geopolitical uncertainty. Meantime, the United States added to its sanctions on Russia Sunday by banning American accounting and consulting firms from working there, as Group of Seven leaders pledged to halt oil imports from the country. In the Philippines, the son of the late dictator Ferdinand Marcos is heading for a landslide victory in the presidential election. With 76 percent of the ballots counted, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. had won almost 60 percent of the vote. His closest rival got 28 percent. Marcos drew on the support of voters comfortable with the strongman rule of outgoing President Rodrigo Duterte. The G7 nations are expressing what it calls grave concern over the process by which Hong Kong chose its next chief executive. The G7 calls it, quote, an assault on the fundamental freedoms of the former British colony. Former police official John Lee, who helped incumbent chief executive Carrie Lam crack down on democracy protests in 2019, was elected to the city's top post in a near unanimous ballot by a Beijing controlled committee. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Mark. Well, today is May 9, a day that we've all been expecting to hear a big announcement out of President Putin in Russia, because this is the day they commemorate their victory over the German Nazi forces in World War II. We had it happen, but we didn't hit, get the big announcement. To explain to us what's going on from his point of view, we turn now to retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett. General Kimmett served as Assistant Secretary of State and also as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense under President George W. Bush. So, General, thank you so much for being with us. What do you make of the fact that we didn't get the big announcement? Was that just us in the media anticipating it, or, or was, did something happen? He just didn't have the announcement to make. Well, I think everybody was surprised by the fact that the uh, Putin speech was, frankly, a nothing burger. Everybody was hoping to or expecting to hear either that he would declare war, he would annex the Donbass, he would mobilize his forces. Uh, he did nothing of the sort. So I think he's just taking a slow, steady approach to this war and uh, hopes that Europe will need gas quicker than he runs out of troops. So uh, how is he doing on running out of troops? Do we have any sense of what's going on, really, in eastern Ukraine right now? Obviously, the march toward Kyiv didn't work, and now that he's going to try this, I'm told it's a double envelopment where he's trying to essentially circle the Ukrainian forces in the east. How's that going? Uh, it's going fairly slow, but uh, as I've said before, the Russians have been acting more like a bulldozer than, than a Tesla. Uh, as you had said earlier, they're going at about a kilometer to a kilometer and a half a day. And unless that movement is uh, attacked from the flanks, uh, that thing has the 
potential of encircling a significant number of Ukrainians inside the Donbass. So do we have any sense, do we have any sense at all whether they are going that slowly on purpose or because they just can't go any faster? Because I've seen some suggestions, maybe they're doing it on purpose. They want it to be very methodical and they don't want to lose too many of their own troops. Well, that's, that's pretty much Soviet doctrine from uh, 75 years ago. Uh, they move forward, they move slow. Uh, I've actually been uh, sort of impressed by their progress because they've done so poorly up to this point. But this looks like the old Soviet tactics they were using rather than these modern tactics that they tried and failed with uh, in Kiev. So what does that say in terms of how you defend against that? Bulldozers dozers may be slow, but they're almost inexorable. What is the best defense yeah. the Ukrainians have and that we have to support the Ukrainians? Well, as I said, when you're doing a forward movement of that magnitude, uh, you're trying to move forward and you really are uh, less concerned about your flanks and, candidly, the logistics base. To keep that inexorable move going, you've got to have the food, you've got to have the supplies, you've got to have the ammunition dumps. You've got to move those up close to that attack, and that makes them extraordinarily vulnerable to these drone-spotted artillery attacks, which have become a daily occurrence by both sides. But the Russians will be far more vulnerable uh, in that situation. There were reports that uh, in the attack from the north, uh, the ratio of Ukrainian forces to Russian forces may have been as, as close as the one to one. Now it's said to be perhaps two to one, Russian versus Ukrainian. How significant is that disparity? Well, in classic military doctrine, the attacker has to have a three to one advantage over the defender. Uh, but I think at this point, the fact that the Russians are not getting resupplied, and we're doing a pretty good job of resupplying the Ukrainians, uh, says that uh, the, Ukra the Russians are at a disadvantage in this maneuver. So what about that resupplying? Uh, we were told they need another $33 billion. How are we doing in getting the armaments where they need to go, when they need to be there? Yeah, that's another surprising thing, David. Uh, even though the Russians are trying to attack that long supply line from the NATO countries up to the front lines, uh, either it has not been covered very well in the press or it's not happening. The Russians don't seem to have that, what we used to call the deep battle, where you're not going against the front line troops, but you're going against the rear. Uh, from all indications, such as those howitzers that they're bringing into the country, uh, none have been interdicted along those supply lines. So the Russians are doing a pretty lousy job at this point uh, going against the Ukrainian supply lines. President Biden, from the beginning, has said he does not want to have the United States going to war with the, the nuclear power of Russia. How are we doing it keeping away from that? Because it seems like we're ramping up our support, including on the intelligence front. Now, it seems to be confirmed mm -hmm. that we help them sink the Moskva, that, uh, that battleship on the, uh, back in the Black Sea. And also some reports perhaps are helping them target at least some of the lower level generals. Well, again, I, I think we've got to make the distinction between providing intelligence and providing targeting intelligence. Look, you have a, a lot of intelligence coming in every day. Uh, we should be providing that intelligence. If we're going to be providing tons of material, we should be providing tons of intelligence. But when you take that intelligence and you refine it to the point where you now have a target, where you now know what to attack it with, you know how much volume of attack you need to do against it, that targeting information is actually developed uh, by the Ukrainians themselves. In many ways, it's against the law for us to do that uh, in uh, precedent that goes back to the Vietnam War. So I think there's a pretty good fire break between what this administration is doing and what the Ukrainians are doing with what we provide to them. Mark, it's always so very helpful to talk to you. Thank you for being here. That's Mark Kimmett. He's retired U.S. Army Brigadier General. Coming up, another rocky day in the markets. Kriti Gupta is going to pick up where we left off on Friday. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, we have yet another turbulent day in the markets, particularly, I must say, on the equity side. And to explain it all to us, we welcome now Kriti Gupta.
Yeah, well, a lot of selling, a lot of red on the screen, and this is going to be important because it's not necessarily the same drivers that we've been talking about year to date. The inflation worries, the growth worries, those are certainly there. But I think we have to ask who's actually driving some of the selling. What uh, does participation really look like? And all of this is going to be largely institutional investors, and they're not necessarily cashing out of their positions, although it does look like that on the surface. What they're doing is they're hedging a lot of their positions. And the way it reflects here is that traditionally at this point in the past two years, when you see a massive sell-off like this, as we've seen in the last couple of weeks or, or months, really, you would see these dip buyers, and you don't see them anymore. And it's once again, it's not because people are selling out of their positions, um, although perhaps some are, so there is part of that. But it's also because they're just kind of stepping back. You're, they're not buying that dip uh, in the past. And what they're really doing is kind of go resetting valuations when you look at the S&P 500. A trader actually told me that the, the consensus here is that the S&P 500 will ultimately trade down to a PE multiple of 16 to 18. We're at about 20 to 21 right now. So by that standard, we still have a lot more selling to go. But when you say they're holding back, that makes me wonder about volume. Yeah, well, so you're going to see a lot of volume right now. And remember, when you put this into perspective, you're not looking at a 100-day volume, right? If you're looking at 10-day volume or 5-day volume, it's going to look like big numbers. And this is pretty natural when you see selling by this kind of margin. You do see heavy volume. But once again, if you look at the VIX, for example, uh, you're looking at a 33 handle. And that isn't a massive jump from where it was, say, a couple of weeks ago or even uh, the last couple of days. So it tells you that in terms of the giant moves, although it looks pretty painful on the surface, you're not actually seeing that much of a change in terms of the underlying plumbing. When you talk about giant moves, we saw a lot of in bonds last week. We're not seeing it today. We're not seeing it today. A little bit of a reversal, in fact. But I think that really speaks to the volatility you're seeing in bonds, because I think we started off this morning at about 311 on the 10-year. It went up to as much as 321 on the 10-year, and then reversed back down to 309. So you once again are seeing volatility by a margin of 10 basis points. And we're, remember, David, we're only about four hours uh, <laughs> into the day for, for when it comes to U.S. trading. So that's going to be a key piece of the bond equation. One last one. It's a favorite one of mine from the weekend. The Saudi Arabians apparently are charging less money for their oil if they sell it to Asia. Yes, uh, they're OSPs. They declined their prices. So the way it works is they have a benchmark rate and they charge kind of a premium to it. That premium was $9.35. They dropped it to $4.40. And a lot of this comes from this assumption that Chinese lockdowns are going to start weighing on demand. And to some extent, they are. Remember, China is the second largest consumer in the world. So that's not just working on oil. It's hitting iron and copper as well. But maybe a barometer of what's going on with the Chinese economy in the meantime. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Kriti for that report on the markets. Coming up, it is going to be our weekly update on the midterms with contributors Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital and Jeannie Shanzano of Iona College. And this is Balance of Power, and we are on Bloomberg Television, and we are on Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. To keep you up to date with news from all around the world, we go now to Mark Crumpton here with The First Word. David, thank you. President Biden will give a speech Tuesday on his efforts to fight inflation. Rising prices are threatening the Democrats' already slim chances of holding on to Congress after the midterms. The president will draw a contrast between his proposals and a plan by Florida Senator Rick Scott to raise taxes and let Social Security and Medicare expire. French President Emmanuel Macron is offering a way for Ukraine to work more closely with the European Union. Speaking to the European Parliament in Strasbourg today, President Macron acknowledged it would take time for Ukraine to become a member of the Black of the bloc. He proposed creating a new, less formal grouping of like-minded countries. The French leader told reporters membership criteria would be geography and a shared set of values. Qatar's ruler will visit Iran this week before traveling to Europe. Bloomberg has learned the trip is part of a diplomatic push to revive faltering efforts to restore the landmark 2015 nuclear deal and discuss selling more natural gas. A year of negotiations in Vienna stalled in March, with Tehran and Washington blaming each other. A key point of contention is the terrorist designation placed by the United States on a branch of Iran's military. Hospitals here in New York are facing a shortage of supplies because of strict COVID-19 curbs more than 7,000 miles away. 
Lockdown measures in Shanghai are disrupting health care services, causing a shortage of chemicals used in x-rays and CT scans. Hospital officials are urging hospitals to ration existing stock and only use for essential cases. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Well, every week we get together with Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital and Jeannie Shanzano of Iona College to talk about the midterm elections, which are coming up in six months from right now. And today is certainly no exception. So, Rick, let me start with old business. Since we've been together, we had the primaries in Indiana and, more important, perhaps in Ohio. We saw J.D. Vance win, uh, triumph with the Trump endorsement. But it wasn't the only one. There were 22 Trump endorsements. As I counted, he won every one. That's right. He won. He cleans uh, the tables in Ohio. Uh, J.D. Vance, a come from behind victory, uh, which signaled uh, the kind of influence that Donald Trump may have in Republican primaries nationwide. And I would say that uh, there was nothing that, that indicated that J.D. Vance could pull this out without the Trump endorsement. And, and Jeannie, today, today, or, I'm sorry, tomorrow, we're going to have West Virginia as well as Nebraska, but in West Virginia, there's also another test a little bit between two Republicans, incumbent Republicans. They got redistricted, and so they had to have two races there. And one of them is really running with President Trump, who is really endorsing him. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. Because of redistricting, we have two incumbent Republicans going against each other, worst case scenario for the party. And the Trump endorsed candidate, Mooney, is doing very, very well, according to the polls. And, you you know, I think there wasn't that long ago in politics in America where we would ask, do endorsements matter anymore? And I think one thing we can say about Donald Trump is he has shown that he could use this old style political tool to his advantage. He has out fundraised, out fundraised the RNC. He has had candidates going down to Mar-a-Lago. And as you mentioned, the candidates he's endorsed so far have done very, very well. The problem is when you pivot to the general election, is he going to prove that these people can win or are they going to lose to the Democrats? And of course, people like Mitch McConnell and old style Republicans are very concerned because, of course, this is a president who lost the White House, the Senate and the House. In primaries, he does really well. In generals, it's still an open question. Rick, one of the viewers just wrote in and said, why does President Trump want to be a kingmaker rather than be the king himself? Is this taking anything <laughs> away from his running in 2024, or is this precursor to that? I think this is a precursor to that, right? If he can show that he still has follow-on strength to get these people elected, especially those who wouldn't get elected without him, then he's going to make the argument to the party, you need me more than I need you, which is exactly the kind of argument he loves to make. Uh, he's going to draft himself into the selection if he's allowed to, and that's exactly the strategy he has. But I think it's too early to tell. Um, uh, May's a long month in primary history. Uh, even though we have a couple of primaries tomorrow, the really big stuff comes later in the month. And, and we're going to see whether or not he can continue this string or whether or not some of these candidacies endorsed are going to fall by the wayside. And one of the big ones this month is actually next week, Jeannie, in Pennsylvania, as we have Dave McCormick uh, up against uh, Mehmet Oz, Dr. Mehmet Oz, which turns out to be almost a proxy war at this point. It's sort of former President Trump against former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. It is. It's fascinating. And you look at the polls coming out there. And once again, you're seeing Donald Trump's endorsement of Dr. Oz has put him up in the polls. They're still within, in most polls, the margin of error. And even in one poll, we have Dave McCormick running third to Kathy Barnett, but still Oz, you know, slightly outpacing them. But of course, he is being attacked a lot of, you know, attacked rather a lot of opposition research being dropped in this race in terms of things like his relationship with the Turkish government and Erdogan and people like former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo raising the issue of whether Dr. Oz is in some way a national security concern. I don't know if that's going to resonate with the voters in Pennsylvania as much, but it certainly has been an ugly and very expensive race out there. Well, and Rick, it was clear that Dave McCormick wanted that endorsement. When he didn't get it, there was some thought that, well, okay, maybe President Trump will endorse Mehmet Oz, but not go too far. And then we heard him really come out full-throated and go after McCormick. This is part of what he had to say. Yeah, this, is, this has been a, a real turnaround for the Oz campaign. Uh, when Trump uh, abandoned the McCormick team, and which is made up of a lot of former Trump officials, uh, one of the things that was left on the table was, well, maybe he'll just phone it in. But he hasn't phoned it in. He's shown up, and he's been a real factor in the Oz campaign. 
but I agree with Jeannie. Watch out for Kathy uh, 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 Barnett. I mean, she's come from behind. She's now even with the field. They're all basically uh, within the margin of error. And, and the fact that she's been able to get late breakers is a good indication of her potential success. Yeah, it, it, you know, and, and it is fascinating because Donald Trump, I agree with the question that somebody wrote in. He has become a kingmaker. I keep calling him the new boss tweed. People are going down to Mar-a-Lago. We've even seen candidates run. They've been running commercials just to appeal to him in the Palm Beach area to try to get his endorsement. These can be local races, state races across the country. He has really proven himself. And when I say he's outraised the RNC, in the last six months of 20. 2021. He outraised them every day except two. These are enormous numbers for Donald Trump. And, you know, it makes him a kingmaker. It also puts him into a position, to Rick's point, if he chooses to run in 2024, he is going to be a juggernaut for the Republican Party. Rick, it seems so far, at least, there's no question that, that uh, Donald Trump has a substantial control of the Republican Party. That does not necessarily translate into the polls in November. I mean, and our update here starts with the primaries, but it's really targeted on the midterms. Is there a chance that, in fact, people are giving hostages to fortune here? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they don't know really what his uptake's going to be in the general election. Remember, he's been a singularly unsuccessful president. Uh, he lost the presidency, he lost the Senate, and he lost the House for Republicans. So his track record on general elections is horrible by modern standards. And so he actually has a lot to prove that these people who he are, he's helping get elected can actually make it through a general election. Can Dr. Oz be a United States senator from Pennsylvania? Will J.D. Vance make it through the general election in Ohio? Uh, and, and that is, that is going to have one uh, important factor on his uh, ability to run for president. And of course, we have another shoe to drop, and that is the January 6th commission, which will be targeted at, at Donald Trump. And he's going to have to overcome that at a time when he's still trying to get votes for the general election for his candidates. And I would say a second shoe to drop is going to be the road decision and how much the abortion mm -hmm. issue plays into Democrats, you know, in an, a year they should not do very well, getting them more energized to get out to vote. Jeannie, you've always had a great professor, but now you're a great TV person as well, because that just teased our next segment, because coming up, Rick and Jeannie are going to be staying with us as we turn from the midterm races to the issues likely to make a difference in those races. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West, and Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital and Jeannie Shanzano of Iona College have stayed with us as we turn from the question of the who to the what, and specifically what issues are likely to be really important in the midterms. Rick, I'm going to start with you because uh, it's a Wall Street question, and you are certainly now a card-carrying member of the greater Wall Street, I must say. So how important is what we're watching right now in the markets and in the economy? Because it certainly is what we cover on Bloomberg every single day. It doesn't seem to be very pretty right now. Yeah, the instability is giving... Uh, uh, a lot of worry to the political establishment, especially those who are going to be on the ballot in November. I just spent a weekend in Arizona with, uh, spent some time with uh, Senator Kelly, and he's very concerned about the impact that inflation's having on his home state and how he talks about it. He knows he has to address it. It's the number one issue in Arizona, flanked by things like immigration, and, and he has to address it. But, but with rising home costs and increasing uh, uh, prices of gasoline, uh, Arizona is experiencing inflation almost like no others. And if he's going to get reelected, and he's a critical element to Democrats keeping their majority, he's got to have an engagement with the voters on this issue. And it's real tough love right now for, for Democrats out there. Jeannie, you teach political science. As far as I can understand, every day we hear it's pocketbook issues. It is, and it always will be. You know, as much as the focus has been on the what the Supreme Court may do with the Roe case, it'll not surpass inflation, the price of gas, the price of meat, jobs, though the economy matters most importantly to people in an election. That's why President Biden's going to be speaking about it tomorrow and why the White House wants him to be on message throughout the rest as we move into November. Jeannie, you said something that might be very important for Democrats, that however important the Roe versus Wade issue is not going to be as important as the economy. Do the Democrats believe that? 
you know, they they want to focus on abortion because they know that when they talk about inflation, a midterm is always going to be a referendum on the party in power. And when the inflation is as high as it is, when you have a president who last week said we could go into a recession in 2023, when you have the Fed tightening, all of these very difficult signs, that's the last thing they want to talk about. So they, they hope they can move it to talk about abortion. They hope they can move it to talk about privacy. And they may be able to. We're still looking at polls coming out since the leak of, of the draft of the opinion, and we don't know for certain how abortion is going to play. My guess is it may even surpass something like immigration. It'll never surpass something like inflation in the economy as the most important issue on people's minds. And again, that's why the president tomorrow is going to be talking inflation. So, Rick, pick up on that, because the only thing I hear almost as much as pocketbook issues is uh, women in the suburbs. Uh, could this really affect at least turnout of women in the suburbs in the midterms? That's right, David. Politics is not one size fits all. Even though we like to, you know, contain our conversations around big macro issues like, you know, what will drive the election outcome in, in November uh, or even in the primaries, the reality is uh, each of these issues affect people differently. Uh, and, and suburban women have been driven by some of these cultural issues, whether it's education that we've been talking about more recently, but also abortion. And, and so if Republicans think that they are going to be able to take advantage of uh, the look that, that suburban women especially are giving our party because of some of the cultural issues dealing with education, uh, they may be rudely interrupted by the conversation that the country is having right now around abortion. And so even though it may not affect all voters the same way, it can definitely have a salient impact on whether or not suburban women are going to be attracted to the Republican Party. And this will affect many of these races in the general election. Uh, they may not be, have a big impact in the primaries, but they will have a big impact in the general election if some of these voters, like suburban women, uh, are upset with our party over its handling of the uh, uh, abortion issue. Yeah, and, and the one thing I would say about the abortion issue, having looked at polls at this for so many years, is that Democrats have to be careful not to misread these polls. Americans generally have very ambivalent views when it comes to abortion. And when we talk only about it as an issue that impacts women, we have to look at those polls more carefully. As an example, young men are among the most pro-choice group out there, seldom discussed when we talk about it politically. So a big question, does this get young men? And young people out to the polls, we don't know. But I think Democrats have to be careful about not engaging in overreach on this. It's an important issue, but jobs in the economy are still number one, and they can't forget that. That impacts everybody. So, so Rick, I want to try to connect up these two questions about some of the people who are running with some of the issues here. Because as we talk about a J.D. Vance, we talk about a Dave McCormick, we talk about a Mehmet Oz, I'm not sure how much they've had to say about the pocketbook issues in the economy. Well, I think that in a general election, that's where they're going to go, because they, they are going to contrast with the Democrats. And, and, and as Jeannie said earlier, this is a referendum on the current administration. And in so much as it is, when you look at Joe Biden's numbers when it comes to handling of the economy, I mean, he's in the low 30 percent approval rating. And that is a fertile ground for Republicans to say, look, this is all about the economic handling of our country. We've got to have a check in the system in the Senate and in the House, and we're the guys who can do that. Republicans tend to always pull better on handling of the economy, but in this case, uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't miss it with a 10-foot pole. This is going to be what drives outcome in the general election, regardless of what cultural and social issues might be on the ballot alongside each of these candidates. And I would just add, you know, as you look at a race like the Senate race in Ohio, where you have Tim Ryan um, running, I think he gives Democrats sort of a playbook. He's going to have an uphill battle, very hard race for him. But he gives Democrats a playbook for how they can try to make inroads in states like Ohio that have been moving more and more conservative and making it tougher and tougher for Democrats. You look at what he's talking about. He's talking about bringing back jobs, manufacturing jobs, competition with China. He's not talking as much about sort of these cultural, social issues, which is where Democrats have had a problem in states like Ohio. So, Jeannie, as I recall, you have an origin in polling way back in your history. <laughs> uh, give us a sense as a viewer here watching these midterms. When should we start paying attention to polls? Uh, is it already a time to do that, or does it take longer? We actually get some nominees. Do we have good state polling? You know, it comes in drips and drabs. You know, right before a big primary, 
primary like Pennsylvania, we're starting to see some. But I think most of the general public doesn't start to pay real attention until you get into the late summer, you know, into the Labor Day time period. And then we'll start to see some real polling. You know, from my perspective, we don't get nearly enough state polling. So that's a plug for more state polling. But we will get more as you get into Labor Day. A plug for more state polling. <laughs> that's what I was waiting for. Thank you so much to Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital and Jeannie Shan Zeno of Iona College. Coming up, Senator Mark Warner of Virginia is here to tell us about what we need to do more than we're doing already with Ukraine. And this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, May 9 has come and gone, at least in Moscow, without President Putin calling for that mobilization some people were speculating about. To give us his perspective on what we think is going on with Moscow as well as in Ukraine, welcome now Mark Warner. He's Virginia senator and also the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee. So thank you so much, Senator, for being with us. Thank uh, you, David. What, what do you make of the fact that he didn't call for mobilization? Well, I think there was a big buildup to... May 9th, which is the anniversary celebrated in Russia of beating the Nazis. And there was a huge fear that uh, Putin might use this as a chance to annex additional territories taken in Ukraine, or even a greater concern that he might declare, formally declare war and fully mobilize his, uh, all of his reserves. The fact that he didn't, I think, may be a, a glimmer of realizing that he has not prepared the the Russian people for that kind of extended all-out war, regardless of the, the language she's used. Uh, that's probably the good reading of, of what happened uh, in May 9th in, in Moscow. The bad reading is uh, this may now turn into this war of attrition that mm. go on literally for weeks or months, and that's obviously not good for the Ukrainian people for yeah. overall world economy. And talk about that war of attrition. We have already done a lot for the Ukrainians. There's more coming, it would appear, in that $33 billion request. What more should we be doing? Well, I think one of the things that has been a very powerful message is we are getting the arms to the Ukrainians now in a pretty smooth fashion. And when you add up, particularly if you add this next 33 billion, which is partially defense and partially economic, you add up what also the Europeans are doing. And we're getting close to 40 to 50 billion dollars of military aid to Ukraine virtually since the war has started. And if you look at the total Russian military budget of only 66 billion, that's got to put give Putin a pause. Mm. I do think as well we need to continue to ratchet up economic sanctions. I, I think one of the things that this has also caused, uh, as I continue to do briefings about the longer term challenge that China presents, I think there are a number of, of business leaders here and around the world that are saying, well, our focus is appropriately on Putin and Russia right mm. now, and we are decoupling. Mm. You know, with the possibility of what she could do with Taiwan in the future, yeah. um, people need to build that business risk with China into their calculations as well. Senator, at the end here, let me make a turn here to the question of Roe versus Wade. It certainly is an explosive issue, certainly has a lot of moral context for everybody on both sides of it, but also has political con context. Mm -hmm. uh, you said you would vote for a bill uh, to codify Roe against Wade. How do you think it plays politically? You know, David, I think as one of your earlier commentators, um, Democrats have to be a bit careful. I think we need to speak out against what is basically a, a very much out there decision by, if it stands by Justice Alito, uh, that basically says if it's not mentioned in the Constitution, uh, things receive no protection, so abortion's not mentioned. Well, I'd also point out that uh, contraception is not mentioned, gay rights are not mentioned, mar marriage equality are not mentioned. I think the, the kind of uh, onslaught of culture wars of taking where Americans' rights are not where the vast majority of us are at. Um, uh, but again, it's so hard to say since people's, uh, people's focus seems to be short, so short term. But if we can make this about protecting people's rights, and as one of your commentators said as well, this is not just women. This is young men. This is people of color. This is a whole lot of folks uh, that may have otherwise been on the sideline getting engaged in uh, these midterm elections. Senator, it's always a true treat to have you with us. Thank you for your time. That's Senator Mark Warner, Democrat of Virginia. Coming up, 
Check out the Balance of Power newsletter on the terminal and online. And coming up on Balance of Power, we're going to continue the second hour on radio. We're going to talk with Notre Dame economics professor James Sullivan about what the fiscal stimulus meant for lower-income families. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.